Welcome to Fountain at Home. My name is Lauren and we want to welcome you to church online. Maybe you're tuning in from your bed and you got your coffee and you're comfy. Or maybe you woke up at 6 a.m. and you already went on a run, made your family breakfast and you are ready to roll. Wherever you're tuning in from, we want to say welcome home. We also have something for your kiddos. Tune in at 12.30, go to our website and we have the resources available for you. Today is super special because it's Palm Sunday. This is the first Sunday that our church and many other churches are celebrating Palm Sunday at home. But just because church looks a little bit different, it doesn't mean that it's not special. We are the unstoppable church. And don't forget, we got a chat room. We love to say hello, engage with you, and also share the love by, by sharing the link. Before we start, go ahead and share this to your social media so we can help everyone in your reach move closer to God today. God is moving online. Here's a few tips to make the most of your fountain at home experience. Engage, jump on the chat. We got a holla back pasta. Don't be afraid in your home to talk back. Number two, lean in, take some notes. Pastor Matt is dropping it. We don't wanna miss it. Go ahead and take some notes with us. Number three, remove any distractions and let's have fun together. We are honored today to worship with our family from afar, Fellowship Church in Antioch. So get your heart ready because we are about to worship right now. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for today. And Lord, I pray for every person tuning in, God, that you would meet them in their homes, that your presence would be with them. Lord, we glorify you, we worship you, prepare our hearts as we enter in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you And holy, there is no one alive
What's up, everybody? Got a few announcements for you, but isn't it amazing that we get to enjoy service at home, whether you're in living room, or in my case, I'm in my son's room, where there's a lizard. How many do you get to enjoy service with a lizard? Listen, a lot of things going up. We have a few announcements for you, but the first thing is if you're not connected in a Zoom group, you have to get connected. Just because we have to practice social distancing, doesn't mean we need to be socially distant. And Zoom groups is the perfect way to stay connected. In fact, check this out. We got a bunch of people on Zoom group right now. Everybody say, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Yeah, and so today, Sunday at 12.30, what do we have coming up right after third service, Michelle? Yeah, guys, you don't want to miss out. Growth Track Step 2, Discover Purpose, where you will find your God-given purpose and design. Right after third service, 1230, click on that Connect Card link, fill it out, and we'll see you there. And then with today being Palm Sunday, this is a huge week for the Christian faith. Andrew, what do we got coming up on Friday? What's up, everybody? We just had an amazing time of live worship and communion happening this past Wednesday. And if you missed it, guess what? We're going to have it again this coming Friday for Good Friday. You are not going to want to miss out. It is going to be an amazing time. So be sure to jump online at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, one week from today being the biggest day of our Christian faith, Easter. Pastor Chris, what is coming up for Easter? Guys, we cannot wait. We have three services this Easter. And we know it's been a little crazy with COVID-19. A lot of things are changing. But one thing that hasn't changed is God's love and purpose for our lives. So we want to invite you to this Easter, three services, 8.30, 10.30, 11.30. We're going to have a great time. And we actually have a challenge for you, okay? We want you to take a picture of your Easter experience. Tag us as a church. Use the hashtag Fountain Easter. We will pick a winner. And the winner will get a fountain care package delivered to their house. Yes, you heard me right, a fountain care package, okay? And for our parents, don't worry. We haven't forgotten about your kids. We wanna bring Easter to you. We can't meet in person, but we want them to have a great experience. So every kid is gonna get a Easter care package. Yes, every kid. And so come by the church on April 7th, this Thursday, between 9 or 11 a.m and 5 to 7 p.m. and we will have a care package for you to pick up. And on Sunday, that Easter, we will have a 2.30 Easter egg hunt in our own home and post about it, share it. We wanna see what um, God is doing um, in your home and use that same hashtag and we can't wait to have Easter together. We love you guys. All right, thanks everybody. So we will see you all this week in our Zoom groups. Ciao. Peace out everybody. Well, listen, we want to do one more thing of worship before we get into the Word of God with Pastor Matt, and that is through our tithes and our offerings. And can we just say, thank you so very much for your faithfulness to give. You are blessing more lives than you know. For example, through our Fountain Shop and Drop, check this out, we were able to get groceries delivered to a house in Texas just through Fountain Care. Furthermore, we actually have a local church that we're in great relationship with that's utilizing our worship center to do their recording for their online services. And so your generosity is blessing people far beyond what you think. And so if you look at the screen right now, there are three ways you can give. First, you can text Fountain Church to 77977. You can click on the giving tab right there on the top of the chat box, or you can mail a check-in to the church. Once again, thank you so much for your generosity. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I do thank you, God, for your faithfulness. God, we cannot outgive you. And so, Lord, every dollar, every penny, every cent, Lord, that is given, we ask that you would bless it. We ask that you would multiply it and not only reach even states outside of California, but God, may you reach the nations through Fountain Church, through this offering. God, may you be glorified through it. Take it, multiply it, use it for your glory in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Good morning, Fountain Church, and welcome once again to Church Online. My name is Matt, my wife Jackie and I, we are the lead pastors here at Fountain Church. And we're just so grateful, especially if you're a first time guest. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to fill out that Connect card. We have a special gift for you. 
But we've been in a series entitled The Unstoppable Church. And this is gonna be our fourth installment and our final installment as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. So I want you to get the most out of our time. So try not to be distracted, don't multitask, but really lean in because I believe God has a word for us today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we dive into the message? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that we would encounter you in a real way. I know that all of us are in a different place right now. Some of us are in a good place and some of us are in a painful place, but nevertheless, we've all been impacted by what's going on. And so I pray that you'd meet us right where we're at, God, that you would change us, that we would leave our time together transformed from the inside out. So do what only you can do as we dive into your word. Holy Spirit, come, come Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. So I love the ocean. Now I'm not always a big fan with the sand getting everywhere, but I can sit all day watching the waves hit the reef line and break so powerfully and sometimes gently as they make their entrance to the shore. Now, there have been times that I'll just sit and watch surfers out in the distance for a long period of time. There's something special to me about watching them wait uh, for the perfect set of waves, for the entrance of the perfect wave. And as they start to roll in, there's just kind of this natural momentum that they create. And I think what's so intriguing is that if you respond properly and you get into position, you can go from being stuck waiting in the ocean to harnessing a momentum that you didn't create, but that leads to the ride of your life. However, if you miss it and you fail to respond, that wave that can propel you can also crush you. You know, there've been so many times that as a kid, I, I just didn't see the waves coming. I had my back to the ocean and, and sometimes they would come out of nowhere as they make their entrance onto the shore and beat me up, throw me down and get caught in the current. Uh, let me just say this, they washed me up. But um, uh, but that's why they say never turn your back on the ocean because a wave can come when you least expect it. Now, I know we're not here to focus on the entrance of waves, but rather the entrance of the one who declares in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 15, for I am the Lord, your God, the one who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah chapter five, verse 22 says, do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. You see, we're here today to celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the spotless Lamb of God. You know, it was here on Palm Sunday that he made his entrance into Jerusalem to lay down his life on a cross that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, as he made his entrance that day, some responded with praise, but some, they responded with crucify him. The point is that when Jesus makes an entrance into our lives and even into specific areas of our lives, how do we respond? The answer to that question, ladies and gentlemen, can result in great momentum and the ride of your life, just like a wave, or it can lead to heartbreak as we try to live our lives apart from God and his best. It's amazing to me how much someone's interest can impact us and provoke a response. Take a look. Ah! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you scared me. I got you. Someone's presence can be a little bit scary, but it can also be super powerful. Many of you guys know Pastor Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church, one of the most influential, if not the most influential church in the world. He surprised a few pastors over Zoom over this last week. And one of them happened to be my friend. His name is uh, Pastor Jared from E2 Church in Sacramento. And they weren't expecting him to show up. He made an entrance that they weren't anticipating. So he jumped on the call and he surprised them. And look at the very touching response. Take a look. Now, you were supposed to move into your new building last weekend? Uh, two weekends ago, uh, March 15th was supposed to be our first Sunday, and that was the first Sunday we couldn't meet. We're, we're keeping a positive attitude, but I think for the church at large, everybody's still trying to figure out, like, how do we pastor everybody through this, you know? And we're just watching what y'all are doing, and we're just copying it. And so, you know, we created the online Facebook group to try to build conversations. And Don't watch okay. us. We're making it all up what? as we go. <laughs> What's up, man of God? Steven. My heart's beating out of my chest right now. You staying alive? 
We're trying. We're trying. Pastor Steven. <laughs> What's up, man? Hey. Hey, hey man. Danielle. Pastor Steven. Wow. <laughs> What's up, man of God? Dude, good. So how are you? Wow. Great to see your face. Oh, God. Great to see you, too. Great to see you, too. Wow. I just wanted to wow. tell y'all this. I, I prayed the day that they started canceling public gatherings and just asked God, to show us something that we could do immediately that wasn't just like, hey, we're praying for you or just putting up Bible verses. You know, all that is good, but it has to go beyond that and really felt like not only the Lord wanted me to encourage you, but also that we want to give you guys $20,000 to help you through this next season. Wow. We love you. Thank you so much. We're going to send $20,000 Wow. To help you guys through this season. Mm. $20,000 just to help with this next month of expenses. Mm. Because we love you and what you're doing. And I wanted to give you guys uh, $20,000 to help over the next month as we're all figuring this out together. $20,000 to help with this next season. Love you. Man, oh. thank you so much, Pastor wow. Stephen. Wow. Thank you. You're the best. It's an honor to stand with you. Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I can't tell you how grateful we are just to know that you guys are paying attention and, and that you see what's going on out here. And um, man, I can't even I can't even express how grateful we are. You're not alone. Yeah. We're with you. Isn't that so special and beautiful? The power of presence. When somebody enters a room, it can change the entire atmosphere. However, when Jesus makes an entrance, not only can he change the atmosphere of a room, but he is so powerful, he can change the very atmosphere of our heart and life in a way that nobody else can. Yet as we sit here today, we have to ask the question, we have to raise the question, how do we respond when Jesus makes an entrance? Whether it's for the very first time, uh, he's making an entrance into your life right now. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus and here you are uh, streaming this online and man, God is pursuing you. How do you respond to that? Or maybe you've been following Jesus for some time and, and he wants to speak into a particular area that you haven't let him in. How do you respond to Jesus when he's making an entrance? Well, as we've been in this series, we've come to understand that we serve an unstoppable God and therefore we are an unstoppable church, an unshakable, unconventional, and lastly, an unafraid church. I believe that our proper response when Jesus is making an entrance is to receive Jesus into every chamber of our heart and our life, both unashamed and unafraid. Romans chapter one, verse 16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news about Jesus we're talking about because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everybody who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. You see, not only is it the power of God unto salvation, but Jesus can step into any situation and bring hope and healing. So what does it look like? What does it look like to respond to Jesus unafraid? Well, number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down. To respond unafraid means to respond with worship. Like that's the appropriate response to the entrance of a king, isn't it? To respond with worship. Now worship simply means to properly kiss the ground when laying down before a superior, to, to, to fall on your face, to worship, to be ready to fall down, to adore one in such a way that it brings you to your knees. In other words, it means to be in such awe and to have such reverence that it drops us to our knees. Now I wanna take you to Matthew's gospel. Now gospel simply means good news to those of you who are new. It just means good news. We're talking about the good news of Jesus. Now in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, it says this. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went onto a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was all alone there and the boat was already a considerable distance away from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. 
I think many times when we find ourselves in a crisis, we are more prone to see a ghost than the Savior. Now, mind you, this was no ordinary entrance. I mean, coming to the disciples walking on water, that's pretty extraordinary. But I think it was hard for the disciples to see and to recognize him as a result of the darkness, as a result of the winds and the waves tossing the boat. I'm sure it was hard to, to get a clear picture of Jesus. And I know it's hard for us sometimes, especially when we're getting a hit from all sides. Now, we're in a pretty significant moment of, of, of time and of history. And I know a lot of us feel like we're being buffeted by waves, tossed back and forth. And it can be hard to see the Savior. And it may seem like you're seeing a whole lot of ghosts and not a whole lot of Jesus. But can I tell you, he's coming to you on the storm that you're facing. He is coming toward your boat. But I think this, I think if we're not careful in times of difficulty, the very thing that God is using to help us, we can be afraid of. And fear has a way of derailing our faith, which starts to distort our worship. We go from worshiping God to worshiping the storm and the circumstance to worshiping our opinion over God's word and truth. If only they would have held on to the words of Jesus when he said to them, go ahead of me to the other side, meaning we're, we're going to the other side where you're not going to be stuck here forever. And can I just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to the other side, that God is with us, God is for us. And no matter what happens, we are victorious. No weapon formed against us as followers of Jesus will prosper. I think we all have experienced moments where Jesus comes walking on the water of our life and we really don't want him to make an entrance. And we really don't want to hear what he has to say. Like he comes walking on the water of our bitterness and he says, I want you to forgive. He comes walking on the water of our marriage and he says, I want you to die to yourself and serve your spouse. He comes walking on the water of our financial crisis and he says, I want you to keep being generous. Walking on the water of our sin and he says, I want you to repent so that you can be free and refreshed. Or he comes walking on the water of our singleness and he says, I want you to trust me in the waiting. Walking on the water of our pain and he says, let me heal you. Walking on the water of our insecurity and he says, let me be your identity. Walking on the water of our emptiness or our frustration and he says, come and spend some time with me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to be free. And it's just crazy because in moments like that, it's like we know God wants to help us, but then sometimes we resist his entrance. You know, I think a big part of it is fear. We, we say things like, I don't think it's going to work. Or, you know, what if Jesus doesn't come through? It's not Jesus. It's not a savior. It's a ghost. And that's where fear starts to creep in and says, yeah, you're probably right. It's not going to work. Yeah, Jesus probably isn't going to come through. And instead of responding by faith, we run from the one who has the power to do something. And the whole time Jesus is saying, just like he did to the disciples, it's me, guys, you know, the creator of all things, the one who's all knowing, who's all present, who's all powerful. Don't be afraid. It is I. So let me just for a moment hit fear in the face. I love what Dave Patterson says. He says, fear is a God given emotional trigger, not a state of being to be lived in. You know, I, I think that many of us are living with an inaccurate fear because we are underestimating who we are in Christ and the power that he's given us to deal with the days we're living in. You see, fear and faith walk alongside each other in life, but only one of them will eventually win and dominate and set the course for the future. Faith will lead you to worship and fear will lead you to wander. So let's consider Peter on the water for a moment. Here we are in Matthew chapter 14. His disciples, Jesus' disciples are in the boat. A storm hits the Sea of Galilee. And it was a storm that was big enough to make seasoned fishermen afraid. So Jesus comes to them walking on the water and they're terrified. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me, guys. And in a moment's time, Peter goes from fear to faith. And he says, well, if it's really you, Lord, invite me to join you on this water walking adventure. To which Jesus replies, let's go. So Peter steps out of the boat in faith and then moments later, he's terrified again. When he saw the winds and the waves, terrified, and he began to sink. But then he has enough faith to cry out to Jesus, save me, to which Jesus pulls him up and he gets back into the boat. The wind stops, they worship Jesus, declaring, you are the son of God, which is what? An act of faith. So they go from fear, terror, faith, fear, faith, fear, faith. I think this is a great picture of our life. And many times we go from faith to fear. And, and But here's the deal is even when fear is present, we can still advance and do what God has called us to do. I mean, think about it. Do you think Abraham was experiencing some fear when he took Isaac up Mount Moriah to offer him to the Lord? 
Do you think Moses was experiencing some fear as he stretched out his shepherd's rod over the sea saying, man, I hope this works? Or what about Esther when she went before the king to ask for the life of her nation, knowing that a death sentence could be the issue? Or what about Stephen as he began to preach in Acts chapter seven and an angry mob began to tighten the circle like hungry wolves as they picked up stones to kill him? I mean, you think there was a little bit of the feeling of fear. Now, the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he speaks about how often he was in danger. He faced shipwrecks and spent the night in open seas, locked in dungeons. He faced fear and he recognized his weakness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. But here's the key. Ladies and gentlemen, lean in. Here's the key. He still showed up to the party. And here's the key for everyone who has ever overcome fear is they move forward in the face of fear. Because many times fear isn't going away, but they still showed up for the fight. They still stretched out the rod. They still spoke to the storm, planted the church, prayed for the sick, obeyed God, gave the offering, fought the lopsided battle. Why? Because faith doesn't succumb to fear. What does faith cause us to do? It causes us to worship and live in awe of God, walking upon the very surface that should consume us, while fear causes us to wander and sink in the very thing that God has invited us to walk upon. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not called to live by fear. Fear will distort our worship. Fear will rob our faith and distort our worship. And the King of Kings, His entrance deserves our worship. That's how we respond. We respond with worship. Number two, if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down. We also respond to the King's entrance, to King Jesus' entrance with obedience. Eugene Peterson was one of the greatest theologians of our day. And at the age 35, he wrote this. He said, I bought a pair of running shoes and I began enjoying the smooth rhythms of long distance running. Soon I was competing in 10K races every month or so and a marathon once a year. By then I was subscribing and reading all of these running magazines. Then I pulled a muscle and couldn't run for a couple of months and all those magazines, even though they were still all over the, all over the house, I never opened one to read. The moment that I resumed running though, I started reading again. That's when I realized that my reading was an extension of something I was a part of. I was reading for companionship and affirmation of the experience of running. I learned a few things along the way, but mostly it was to deepen my world of running. If I wasn't running, there was nothing to deepen. And so the parallel, he says, with scripture reading, he says, is striking. He says, if I'm not living an active response to the living word of God, then reading about his creation, salvation, and holiness really won't hold my interest for long. But the most important question, he says, isn't what does this mean, but what can I obey? Simple obedience will open up our lives to the text more quickly, he says, than any number of studies, dictionaries, or concordances. I love Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 36. It says, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent went out and found it just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked, why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they answered. And then they led the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over it and put Jesus on it. As he rode along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And as his disciples approached the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Now you can imagine Jesus looking at his disciples saying, it's time to ride into Jerusalem. And they're like, are you serious? It's about time. Let's go take Rome out. Let's go take back what's ours. What are you going to ride on? And Jesus looks at him, a donkey, this donkey. They're like, what? Like you're the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Like you're going to ride in on a donkey? How about a stallion? We need to get you a a PR person, Jesus. Are you serious? You're going to ride in on a donkey. But this was so profound. Not only was it profound, but it was actually prophetic, spoken by the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine, he said that the Messiah would come this way. In fact, it says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. 
You see, they wanted Jesus to come and overthrow the oppression of Rome, but Jesus came not to bring judgment, but to bear judgment, to do, go to the cross in weakness and, and suffering. Now, now sure, Jesus could have come and knocked out a couple of Romans, but that, that would have been a limited amount of freedom for a few people for a few years. But you see, Jesus came for something so much bigger. He came to take the divine wrath on human sin that the human race deserves as a result of rebellion against God and, and the mistreatment of our neighbor. He came to bear that wrath on the cross, the, the wrath that you and I deserve. Why? So that we could be forgiven, so that we could be free, so that evil and death would be destroyed forever. Luke chapter 19, verse 33 says that as they were untying the colt, its owners asked, why are you untying the colt? And they were wondering like, why are you taking my donkey? And the disciples replied, just as Jesus said, because the Lord needs it. Now, I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be a sufficient answer for me. <laughs> the Lord needs it. I would have been like, what do you mean the Lord needs it? <laughs> like explain yourself. But I think this is a great picture of obedience. Now, many of you guys know I have three girls. I have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. And when I tell them to do something, a lot of times now they want to know why. I always get the why question, right? Why, daddy, why? Explain it to me, then I'll do it, daddy. And sometimes it's because they really wanna know and other times it's because they don't agree. And so they're trying to find a way out. But I think a sufficient answer would be this. I'm 40, you're eight. Ton deal, right? It doesn't work that way a lot though. They're like, no, daddy, please tell me. But I love what Tim Keller said. He said that Jesus, what Jesus was saying here is if you only obey me because you understand why or because you like the explanation, then that's not obedience. That's agreement. And you haven't truly submitted to the authority of the King of Kings. He really isn't Lord over your life. Hebrews chapter eight, verse five says that even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. He came to know firsthand what it costs to maintain obedience in the midst of great suffering. I mean, think about all of the temptations. I mean, those had to have been so difficult to deal with. How about the cross as Jesus was in the garden saying, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And as he obeyed his father in the face of each temptation and trial, he learned obedience. You see, testing and trial is a great training ground and strengthening ground for our faith and obedience, even when we don't get it, even when we don't understand. I mean, look at Jonah. God told him, I want you to go to the capital of the enemy country and preach to them that they might not be destroyed. And Jonah's like, what? I don't get it. And they've been trying to destroy us and you want us to go and, and you want them to be saved and you want to use me to do it? And because he didn't understand, what did he do? He ran away. And that was not a good deal. You should go back and read the book of Jonah. Great wisdom there. But if Jesus is gonna be the Lord of our life, we have to trust and obey that he has our best in mind, even when we don't understand. And if we don't, he's really not Lord of our life. He's more like our assistant. But ladies and gentlemen, listen, because he came in weakness to suffer and die, we can trust him. I think we can learn from the donkey as well. <laughs> yeah, you can learn from a donkey, right? Normally a, a young, untamed, unridden donkey would not be excited to have someone ride on it but this donkey is now under the Prince of Peace, the one who spoke to the wind and the waves and they calmed, the one who healed the sick, the one who raised the dead. See, when you and I fall in love with God and come up under Christ and his word, we too experience that same rest and joy. And, and like John says, he says it this way, he says, loving God means keeping his commandments. When we're in love with God, man, we're gonna wanna keep his commandments. And he says, his commandments are not a burden. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus makes his entrance, how should we respond? Well, if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down, is we should wait with great expectation. In John chapter five, there's a story of a man who had been an invalid for 38 years. That's three decades, that's a long time. And he's sitting by this pool called Bethesda where a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Then Jesus makes his entrance into this man's life in verse six and it says this. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him a great question. He said, do you want to get well? Now, some believe the man's reply, uh, some believe he was giving excuses. Others believe that this man was just being honest, like, yeah, I want to get well, but I really can't figure it out. So it goes on to say, it says, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. 
while I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. Now, I don't think this man ever thought nor could have imagined that Jesus was about to heal him. I mean, he's been in almost four decades of brokenness and Jesus does a miracle in a moment's time. I remember thinking at one point in my life that I would never see uh, 18 years old. Uh, I thought my future was doom and gloom and that the dream of being married and having a family was a distant, faint idea. And now I just look back and my mind is blown at, at all that God has done. When I was battling anxiety, like I told you uh, in the first message of the series, it lasted three and a half years. I never thought I was going to be free. I never thought I was going to get out of that anxiety and depression. And here I am, and God has done exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that I could ever ask, think, or imagine. However, I still have an autoimmune disease that my healing is yet to be manifested. And, and, and yet I still sit here looking at you today with great anticipation about what God will do and how God will use this for His glory. You see, the goal isn't always relief from our circumstance, but rather that God would use my circumstance for His glory, for my good, and for other salvation, no matter what that looks like. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the goal. If we have Him, we have everything. So as we look at the Gospels, we see Jesus healed quite a bit. 17 bodily cures, six deliverances of demoniacs, three raised from the dead, nine miracles over nature, and that's just the ones that were recorded. In fact, John is quick to remind us that Jesus did many other things as well, but he says if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written, John chapter 21, verse 25. So whatever you're facing today, no matter how long, no matter how bad, how impossible it may seem, Jesus has made an entrance and He's coming to you walking on the storm. He's coming to you walking on the water of your situation, not as a ghost, but as the Savior. Not to harm you, but to heal you, to help you, to strengthen you, to teach you, inviting you to walk with Him. So wait, ladies and gentlemen, with great anticipation in this time because God is on the move. He's working on your behalf. And today is the day. Listen, if you don't know him personally or if there's an area of your life that you have yet to worship him in, obey him, or if there's an area where you need to wait in great expectation, today is the day. And, and we wait knowing that as we are living in these last days, listen, Jesus is coming back. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. No one knows the day or the hour, but I do know this, that he's coming again. And so I want to live and prepare like it's today. And, and listen, when he comes back, when he makes his entrance, it's not going to be in weakness as a servant, but as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords. So until then, we wait with great expectation the return of Christ. So what I'm saying is this, is that when Jesus walks in, when He makes an entrance, we should go, wow. We should worship, we should obey, and we should wait with great anticipation. And today is the day to surrender. Listen, if you're here today and you need to surrender to Jesus, maybe for the first time, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. I, I wanna pray a commitment prayer with you. Now, there's nothing magical about this prayer. It's just to help conf you confess what God is already doing on the inside of your heart. And so if that's you, would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today I surrender. I worship you. Lord, I, I wanna obey you with everything that I am not because it's a burden, but because I love you and I know I need you. And Lord, I, I ask right now that you would forgive me for all of my sin. I invite you into my heart. Lord, I hear you knocking at the entrance and I invite you in today. Lord, come and change my life. Come and heal my heart. Lord, wash me clean, make me brand new. God, I give you all my fear, all my doubt, all my pain, I give you everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly, my life is yours. And I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that you rose again on the third day and you are alive. I don't want you just to be my Savior. Today, I confess you as my Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Give me a hunger for your word. And Lord, I just ask that you would help me to live unafraid in Jesus name. And everybody said, 
Amen. Come on, can we give the Lord and those who made the decision for the very first time a big hand? Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we do what we do. And I just wanna thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being such an incredible church. I know, listen, if you're watching, people have been praying for you. And so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a moment and we're gonna fill out the Connect card. So the Connect card is gonna be located right at the top of your screen, uh, right above the chat box. You can click on that, fill it out with as much information as you're comfortable with. Uh, there's a multiplicity of next steps for you to take. If you confess Jesus as Lord for the very first time, go ahead and mark that box or you can raise your hand in the chat so we can follow up with you and make sure that we give you some resources to help you grow in your faith and your relationship with Him. And then also, we'd love to invite you to jump into our growth track. It's gonna happen right after second service uh, at 1230. And we're gonna jump into step two today. So growth track, you can jump in at any time. So if you hadn't done step one, it's okay. You can jump right into step two. And step two is called discovery. It's more like a lab where you're gonna discover a little bit more about how God made you. Uh, you're gonna take a personality a profile test. You're gonna, you're gonna take a spiritual gifts test. And in this, we believe that your purpose is connected to your design. So we'd love for you to take that step today. If you need to get water baptized, it's coming. Mark that box. If you wanna get involved in fountain relief in any way, go ahead and mark that box. And if you are a first time guest, don't forget to fill that out because we have a gift that we want to give you. Well, listen, we love you church so much. And before we go, I really just feel led to pray for some of you who are following Jesus, but there's areas that you've yet to surrender. And so as we go, let me pray for you. Father, I pray today, Lord, that we would worship you with all that we are, that we would obey you with all that we are, and that we would wait with great expectation. I really believe that there's some of you that have been waiting and you've gotten discouraged in the waiting. But today the Lord is resurrecting faith in you again to believe for the impossible. God is doing something in you right now and that no longer are you gonna wait with great discouragement, but you're gonna to start to wait with great anticipation knowing that any moment God can move. And so Father, I pray Lord for every person that's watching right now, for every follower of Jesus, Lord, strengthen them in their innermost being. Lord, as we navigate these unprecedented times, may we navigate with the heart that's unafraid. May we be wowed by you, worship, obedience, and waiting with great expectation. May we be wowed by you and not the storm. In Jesus name. Amen. This has been such an awesome series. I've been loving it. Unstoppable God, Unstoppable Church is like my new life motto. I'm gonna get it tattooed on me after this quarantine is over. You can come with me if you want. But really, we wanna stay connected with you throughout the week. So follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook. And we also have a Facebook care group that you can follow us on too as well. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be awesome. And don't forget at 1230, we have growth track and kids. So jump onto that. We love you guys. We're praying for you. We miss you. And uh, we'll see you next week for Church Online.